settle. It's nice and early, so I like that. A lot of the pizza places around here don't open till 4 o'clock, but these guys are always open before lunch, so I like that. And these are thin crust pizzas, which I prefer. Now I've got a couple of shout-outs. I hope I pronounce the name right. This is a friend of uh, Zayn Mohammed, uh, Sahir Lodi, Lod Lodi. I I'm not sure how, to, how you pronounce that. Sahir Lodi. Anyways, uh, shout out to you, my friend. Tony's Ponies from Wales. Shout out to you, Tony. And Nino Cappuccino. Nino Cappuccino. Okay, shout out to all three of those people and a big shout out to all you people as well. I love the fact that you support my channel. That's just wonderful. So anyway, I'm going to move things around a bit here. Make some room. I'm starving. Zevon, and I've mentioned this before a few times, wrote a song. It was a hockey song called Hit Somebody, the hockey song. And he mentions Big Beaver, so chances are he probably looked at a map and Big Beaver stuck out and he thought, yeah, that'll work. Saskatchewan is a prairie province. It's often referred to as the uh, breadbasket of Canada because it's, um, you know, it's farmland mostly. You know, central, southern Saskatchewan, it's, uh, you know, wheat, alfalfa. Uh, in the last uh, few years, it's been canola, that sort of thing. But um, that's where a good portion of the, the wheat comes from, is that province, or it did at one time. Now, northern Saskatchewan, there's a lot of uh, uh, mining, uh, potash, uranium. There's actually a city called Uranium City. And northern Saskatchewan is very beautiful. Lots of lakes and evergreen trees, that sort of thing. Really nice. Central Saskatchewan, they're very flat. There's a few dips, a few valleys, and a few hills. They have a man-made mountain they made for the 1971 Winter Olympics. But in southern Saskatchewan, it's like the parts of it, the rolling hills, that's where I was born. Other parts around the city of Regina is flat as a pancake. There's an old saying, you can watch your dog run away for three days. That's how flat it is. I was born in a town called Rockland, less than 10 miles from Montana border. Back in those days, people went across the border, just, you know, like they were going to the mall, you know, no big deal, you know. My parents got married in Scobie, Montana. People go down there to for drink, go for dinner, shop, and vice versa, you know. So anyways, I was born in Rockland. We lived there for about two weeks, and my dad and a friend of his had a garage. But my dad was offered a really good job in Buffalo Gap. And um, he decided to take that job. back to Rockland. Rockland hasn't changed in a hundred years. I mean, the Dreamland Theater is still there. The Main Street looks the same as it did probably a hundred years ago. You know, just train station is still there and the elevator and, you know, things about 300 people live there. I think it's about 300. And 
never seems to change a population because the younger people just stop and move away. But then a lot of times other people move back, you know, and just kind of hovers around 300, I think. Karnak is a bit bigger. I think about 700 people, I think. They have a Facebook page and a lot of community events go on there, you know, rodeos and parades and Karnak was always the bigger town of all of those four. And Big Beaver hasn't changed a lot. Pretty much the same, you know. Looks the same as it did years ago. Now Buffalo Gap, I have a picture of Buffalo Gap taken, I think back in the 20s and 30s. And, you know, there was, it was actually a little town. officially no longer a town it was a hamlet it was called a hamlet now i meant to google the population downsize from a town to a hamlet like Hamlet. But when we moved there, uh, not including our family, there was about eight families living there. So there was less than ten families living there when we moved there in 57. So that's hardly a town. When we moved there, there was one store run by a fellow named Newt Johnson. store, like the old general store, you know, the screen door that squeaks. You walk in, you had a barrel, a big wooden barrel full of apples, so the first thing you could smell was apples. And when I was a little kid, I'd walk in, I'd say, Newt Johnson, I smell apples. And then he'd always give me one. I guess he thought I was hinting or something. But that's the first thing as a kid I remember, was when you walk in, you could smell fresh apples. long before he folded up his store and moved. There was just not enough business to have a store there. Now there was a post office. These people, Peggy and Albert, lovely couple, they uh, ran the post office out of their house. into either silos or rail cars 
in this case it was rail cars because the train would come along and park right beside the elevator and then load the grain into uh, elevators or into into box cars sorry That was his job. He was a, a grain agent for the Saskatchewan wheat pool. So our house is right at the very end of the street. And when I see street, it's like this gravel road. There was no pavement in that town or within miles and miles. Coronac was the only town I remember that may have had some paved roads back then. They do now, but back then they... I'm not sure they did back then. They might have. All the roads are on their gravel if they're all just like a grid, you know, like back roads. But they were like the main roads, you know. You know, the graveyard, when you turn off the main road coming from Coronac, you know, the, there's the, uh, the cemetery right there, the Buffalo Gap Cemetery. Saskatchewan, like I said, it's very flat. It's nothing uncommon to see, you know, grain elevators everywhere. Or back then, every town had grain elevators. You could see them for miles. And they always had the name of the town written on the grain elevator. You'd see farm equipment, you know, uh, new, used, old. You'd see abandoned properties, uh, a lot of abandoned farms, a, a lot of abandoned, uh, uh, you know, farm uh, equipment, you know, old tractors and walkers and combines and stuff like that, harvesters, whatever. So, Buffalo Gap was a very small community. I mean, like I said, it was a hamlet. Once Newt Johnson pulled out, there was no store. Shopping was Cornac or Big Beaver. Now, I wasn't old enough, but my siblings went to school in Big Beaver. There was five kids and my mom and dad, and we were all in this tiny little house, and I mean small, tiny little house. It um, it had, I think, uh, one bedroom on the main floor and two bedrooms upstairs. So a lot of us all had to sleep together. And we also had to bathe together. Our house had no running water when we first moved in and we never had a flush toilet the whole time we lived there. There was a pump out front, like a hand pump for a well, and we used that. And I remember my dad and my neighbor eventually hooked up, uh, they got a real pump hooked up, like a, an electric pump. So then our one and only sink in the kitchen, one 
basin sink and one or one and only tap. You could actually turn the tap and the pump would come on and it would you know you'd have running water. We had an outhouse. used mainly for the summertime. In the winter, down in our, our basement, the basement was like a dugout. And I have a picture of it that I took in 2015. And it hasn't changed one scrap. It's identical to the way it was, you know, 50, 60 years ago, whatever. My mom used to have a lot of candy jars at the end there. You know, her peaches and apples and, you know, her canned beans and whatever. Tomatoes. And my dad, right in the foreground, there's a my dad had built a, uh, a a wooden box, and they had this five-gallon pail they had sitting inside there, and that was our, our toilet. Uh, my mom, she was so hardworking. She would love that pail up those steep stairs, and she'd make a beeline for the back door. And she she wasn't running, but it's what you'd call power walking with this big bucket just. My sister and I would be, you know, plugging our noses, uh, you know, like this, dancing around, making a big deal out of it. But that was just a ritual she had to do every, you know, maybe once a week or so. So three years older than me, we were the closest in age, so we all slept in one bed. There was me and um, two of my sisters slept together. No, yeah, in one bed, then my other sister slept in another bed in the same room that my brother had his own room. And my parents slept in the main floor in their bed. There's no bathtub, so we have those big golf and nice round tubs. You don't see too many of those anymore. But they just have in their bedroom and they just pour water in there. You know, get the tea kettle, pour some hot water in, some cold water, get it warm, and that's how they bathe. My little sister and I, we bathe in the living room together in the same water. Believe it or not, after my other siblings had had their baths, we just use the same water. Sounds gross and disgusting, but when you're a little kid, you don't know any better. So like I said, my, my siblings rode the school bus, which picked them up, took them to school in Big Beaver. And Big Beaver had a dance hall that dances every weekend. Very nice. Real family type thing. They had a lot of curling. Uh, they used to show movies sometimes in that, that same hall. Uh, Santa Claus would come there in the winter, you know, and for Christmas they'd show up there. There was a store called Ost. 
general store. Roy and his wife, Aust, Roy and his wife, I can't remember her name, the last name was Aust, so Roy, Aust, and his wife. I'll be okay, I promise. They ran that store, and their son, Ronnie, Ronnie helped run the store too. Siblings, when they come home from school, they'd always have to pack a lunch. And they had those old metal lunch boxes. And the, uh, the school was grade 1 to grade 12, all in the same room, basically. And uh, so they'd pack these metal lunch boxes. My mom would wrap everything in wax paper, sandwiches, and apples. And when they came home, I'd, I'd open up their lunch uh, buckets, their lunch uh, pails. And I would always take off the apple cores, like by then the the apple cores are all chewed, they've gone kind of brown, you know, when apple does, it turns brown. And I would take it out, I would just finish it off. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world, I'd just finish off all those apple cores. Because I was just a little kid, right? Just remember, you know, just like a, you know, a little gopher just going at it, you know. a bad 
badger coming around. This badger's coming around killing people's chickens. We had we had a pig, and um, we had a cow for a short time. We always had a pig, and we had a few chickens. And this badger was coming around. It was killing everybody's chickens. So my dad finally um, he he cornered it out there and he shot it with his twenty-two. so exciting when the train would come through because the mail would come on the train or parcels or you know people from the next town or something and there was a little train station about the size of a tool shed with a, a little overhang like a, a bus shelter attached to it that was the train station That was always exciting when the train came through. Now, oh, here's another name for you. Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Yes, there's a town called Moose Jaw. run for the house and you know and uh, my mom would say that's oh, okay don't worry about it you know they're they'll be gone in a minute and they were but I couldn't say jets I'd always say debts I say mom the debts is coming I couldn't say jets but you knew what I meant
just under 10 inches of rain. I mean, we used to get funnel clouds, you know, like tornadoes, like wild ones, mostly just funnel clouds that would kind of mess us or whatever. Thunderstorms that would just, you'd think the world was coming to an end. I mean, just the crack and just the, the thunder was terrifying. But this storm was different. Because it dumped so much rain. Because the winds and the rain, a lot of the rail cars became derailed. The mud was just washing onto the tracks, washing out the roads. Um, this one farmer, a lot of his livestock drowned and some had just literally floated away, you know. And uh, a lot of people lost livestock because they just, just drowned. You think of 10 inches of rain in an hour.
When I saw that after the storm was going to strike us, I started to close up my elevator doors and windows. When that was done, I cut the power, switched to the in, on account of lightning striking, and then my, made my way back to my house. I was knee deep in the mud. From my ankles to my hips, I had bruises the size of the golf balls from the hailstones. Now that was followed by um, an agent from the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool, uh, who was actually my father. He's the one who uh, filed that. So that's quite interesting. somewhere of her age. I mean, she was just a, a big kid as far as I was concerned. She was kind of like a, an adult, right, to me. But I remember the wedding. All the cars decked out in the church and all that. On Coronac. It was where we went to church every Sunday. there. They got married in 51 and they had their 10 year anniversary at that church. There's like a hall off to the side of it and they had this like big dinner there and all that. But yeah. I remember the flower girl for that wedding my sister Roxanne's wedding, she was so tiny, her name was Glenda, tiny little thing. I remember they just rolled down the back window and they passed her through the window because we had to give her a ride to the church. That was weird as it sounds. was very mature for her age. Um, you know, she made the marriage work, raised three kids, you know, and uh, even raised a couple of grandkids, helped raise them. And uh, yeah, she, she had quite an extraordinary life, but she passed away in 2018. And she's buried in the uh, cemetery in Buffalo Cap. Oh, we had to move. 
both the sides could do. Let me, let me move into that little house. I remember that house so well. I remember Christmases there. You know, a couple of Christmases. I remember a little Cocker Spaniel dog named Shorty. The neighbors had a Dalmatian named Laddie. That tiny little house is still there. A lot of the people that live in that town, of course, passed away. I thought they were old until I visited the graveyard a few years ago and looked at their tombstones and realized they were like in their 50s and this sort of thing. So basically my story ends there. You know, um, not much more to tell because I can only remember, you know, um, I mean, I moved there when I was a couple weeks old and I only remember from when I'm like basically mostly four and five, maybe a little bit when I was three, but mostly four and five. But in 2015, Linda and I drove across Canada. changed. Coronac. Structurally it's the same but they got a lot more newer houses and newer buildings and it's the only town that seems to sort of grow a little bit, you know. But when you go to Buffalo Gap, Rockland or Big Beef, or you're stepping back in time, Coronac is more modern. And we spent a night in Buffalo Gap. Canada, and the only people living there now, my friend Jimmy, him and his wife live there, they're the only ones that are living in his parents' house, he's lived there all his life, and he was born in 1956, he's lived there all his life, and that's fine, no, he wasn't home at the time, he was away, but uh, his wife was there, Debbie, and we had a nice visit with her, lovely woman. camped in the front yard of my old house and there's a picture of me standing in front of that house so tiny the only difference is when you see me standing there the door is right behind me the door used to be to the left it used to go in this way not, not this way so it was to the left they, they moved it at one point for some reason not sure why
It was so nice to see all those old towns, you know. Big Beaver looked the same. Oh my god. Something interesting I gotta tell you. When we um, woke up the next day in Buffalo Cap, we had to keep going because driving across Canada takes a long time. And we had to catch the ferry to Newfoundland. And we had about a week and a half to get, a, to get there, so we had to get moving. And uh, we stopped at Big Beaver just a few miles east of Buffalo Gap, and I'm driving through there looking at all the old buildings, we're taking pictures, and we stop at uh, Ost's store, and Ronnie Ost was there, and I was talking to him, and he clearly remembered my mom and dad, and my older brother Wayne, and Rock, why well, he knew Roxanne, because Roxanne lived there all her life, she lived there and died there. Sharon vaguely remembered Brenda but didn't really remember me because I was just a little kid the older kids you would have seen them around at school and, and that sort of thing and seen them in the store all the time like I said I was five when I moved from Buffalo Cap to Saskatoon so anyways we were talking for a while and I told him about I said you know Ronnie the thing I remember the most about you was that time you pulled up to Janet Nelson's house and you called me and Jimmy over and gave us a bottle of orange crush. And um, he said that, that he remembered that. But he didn't know that I was the other kid, so he remembered that incident. So we were talking and a few laughs, so we left, said goodbye. So as we're leaving, Linda and I are getting into the, uh, the our truck and camera getting ready to drive away. And all of a sudden, uh, Ronnie opens the door, he goes, you know, like, like, wait a minute, right? And then he disappears. Comes back, he's got two balls of orange crush. <laughs> Kiss me, I mean, it, they weren't the glass balls or the plastic bottles, but still, it was two bottles of orange crush, so that was pretty cool. That was nice. That's funny, because Linda's not a pop drinker. But one pop she will drink is orange crush. My sister Brenda, the one who's three years older than me, that was her favorite pop when she was a kid, and still is. She still drinks Orange Crush. But that was so funny. Dust 
storms are unbelievable too. That's why they always have these um, these fences for uh, for erosion or not erosion uh, for accumulation, whether the sand or drift. They're like a, called a drift fence or something like that because of the sand and the dirt and the soil would just drift and drift. So they had all these fences. A lot of times the fences were bent over from all the weight, but it would keep the uh, keep the dirt down and all the dust and everything. Out of big rolling trees around their house to protect them from wind and, and dust and dirt and everything. Because the dust storms back then were just unbelievable. But I remember playing out on the road with me and my friend Jimmy. We had red wagons. story right now hope you enjoyed this one so you take care thanks for uh, tuning in thank you for commenting I appreciate your comments and look after yourself look after each other and uh, until next time you take care